I think my favorite thing about crossover fighters is seeing how characters from different gaming genres get adapted into the format of a fighting game. It's neat seeing how characters from action platformers like Zero, Strider, and Arthur get tools and techniques originally designed for getting from point A to point B in a platformer get worked into a fighting game moveset. With beat-em-ups and character action games being really close relatives of fighting games, characters like Dante, Captain Commando, and Hagar tend to fit absurdly well in fighting games, almost being able to replicate mechanics from their home series in some cases. It's even fun seeing characters from other fighting games because they can sometimes bring mechanics specific to their fighting game series along, giving them a little more flavor. Things like Crimson Viper and Marvel 3 having Street Fighter 4's focus attack as a part of a moveset, or Kiyosuke having the ability to do Rival School styled aerial raves in CVS 2. I've already covered the most triumphant example of this in a previous video. Phoenix Wright, the protagonist of Ace Attorney, a cross between point and click adventure games and visual novels. There's one other character in the Versus games who also occupies a similar niche, Saki Okane, a character hailing from the Japan-only Quiz Nanairo Dreams. Characters from games that are virtually unknown outside of Japan aren't new for the Versus games. Jin is probably the best known example of this, though re-releases of Cyberbots have raised a little bit more awareness of that series worldwide at least. What makes Saki stand out is that Quiz Nanairo Dreams is a game completely devoid of any player-controlled combat. It's a trivia game and dating simulator hybrid. Let me explain. Quiz Nanairo Dream starts with the player avatar character stargazing one night, when some mysterious gemstones rain down from the sky, one of which hits the protagonist. A small fairy comes out of the gemstone and explains that they're the rainbow gems, of which there are eight. They were used to seal away a demon lord from the Makai realm, and the player now has six months to obtain the other gems in order to prevent the demon lord from being freed. Thing is, the other gems are now in possession of seven separate women, and winning their heart over and assembling their gems is the only way to prevent the Demon Lord from returning. You bond with and form connections with each character via trivia questions. A lot of these are based around very specific pieces of Japanese history and pop culture, which is probably why the game was never released outside of Japan. The game was ported to PlayStation and Sega Saturn afterwards, containing new content in the form of two additional branching paths which allow you to potentially romance the fairy I mentioned earlier, as well as Linz, a recurring enemy throughout the game that serves as the aforementioned Demon Lord's lieutenant. In the console ports of the game, almost every major character was renamed, as the original arcade release was sponsored by various candy companies, most of whom ended up being referenced in the names and surnames of some of the characters. They were presumably changed to avoid licensing issues down the line. In the arcade version, Saki's surname was Kanebo, likely named after the Japanese company of the same name. Though best known for their personal care products these days, they also at one point were in the frozen desserts business, having merged with Tachibana Confections in 1965. In the console port, she's renamed as Saki Omokane and referred to as such in all subsequent appearances of the character. Saki is a 16-year-old high school girl that seems relatively normal, but in truth, she's also a part of <sighs> the International Defense Force Far Eastern Branch 3rd Military District 7th Division 11th Specialized Division Regiment Affiliation 3rd Mobile Guerrilla Group. <sighs> Basically, she fights kaiju on a regular basis with a big-ass gun. According to Kenichi Ueda, one of the graphics designers for the game, Saki's design was originally intended to evoke the lead character of the TV anime adaptation of Anne of Green Gables. After being told the initial design wasn't cute enough, she was reworked into the final design. Her character design is also reminiscent of the plug suits worn by characters in Neon Genesis Evangelion, a similarity even pointed out by the game's official guidebook. All of this, unsurprisingly, makes Saki probably the most memorable character from her game, since most of the other characters hold fairly normal occupations, like teaching or photography. This is perhaps the reason why she was chosen to represent the game as an assist character in the first Marvel vs. Capcom game, which is probably the Versus series appearance most people know her from. There's a bit more to talk about in regards to her character, because there's some deep lore that doesn't really seem to be known or mentioned at all outside of the game and some supplemental material. More on that in a bit. She'd later appear as an unlockable character in the console port of Tatsunoko vs. Capcom Cross Generation of Heroes, being one of four characters added exclusively to the Wii version of the game. 
She remained on the roster for the game's 2010 update Ultimate All-Stars, being promoted to a starter character, no longer needing to be unlocked. Saki's voice actor in Tatsunoko vs. Capcom is Yoko Hana. She's done voiceover roles in games like Grand Blue Fantasy, Dot Hack, and Xenoblade Chronicles X, but a chunk of her portfolio involves Japanese dubs of various Western shows, voicing Jade in Jackie Chan Adventures, Atomic Betty, and Yin in Yin Yang Yo. Saki is one of the Versus series' more interesting characters to talk about, so let's get started. Saki is one of a handful of characters to appear in the Versus series that debuted as an unplayable assist character in the first Marvel vs. Capcom game. She flies on screen, fires an energy bolt from her oversized gun, and flies off screen just as quickly as she came. Her Player 2 color replaces the red coloring with pale blue instead. This one's a Toku shoutout, specifically to the Ultra Guard uniform from Ultra 7. To guarantee her selection before a fight, on the assist select screen, hold heavy punch and start. The neat thing about the Capcom assist in Marvel 1 is that they're specifically oriented around Capcom's arcade history rather than their console output, so there's some pretty interesting deep cuts present. As a matter of fact, this seems like the perfect opportunity to go over the Capcom assist in the game alongside Saki in a little more detail. First off is the Unknown Soldier. This is the Player One character from Capcom's horizontal shooter, Forgotten Worlds. I've talked about him and Forgotten Worlds' surprisingly well-implemented presence in Marvel 1 in the previous video. He's got a pretty decent grounded projectile that's good for space control and briefly locking down grounded opponents. The Player Two colors for the assist reference the Player Two character from Forgotten Worlds, who may or may not be the same 2P character that appears as an enemy in Final Fight. Will Capcom ever definitively confirm if they're the same character? The world may never know. To guarantee a selection, hold Light Punch and start at the Assist Select screen. Next up is Lou from Capcom's 3 Games in 1 arcade title Three Wonders. Three Wonders is made up of three separate selectable minigames. Midnight Wanderers, an action platformer, Chariot, a shoot 'em up and Don't Pull, a puzzle game. It's an episodic setup similar to what Kirby Superstar would employ on Super Nintendo a few years later. Lou and his travel partner Siva are playable in Midnight Wanderers and Chariot, and in Marvel 1, Lou hops on screen and shoots arrows while also employing the Firestorm ability from Midnight Wanderers as well. The Player 2 colors give Lou Siva's color scheme and changes Firestorm to being orange. To select him, hold Medium Punch and start at the Assist Select screen. Arthur is similar to Saki in that he debuted as an assist character in this game before being promoted to a proper playable character down the line, debuting in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. He jumps on screen and chucks a few lances at the opponent before hopping off screen. If Arthur gets hit by an attack, he'll actually lose his armor, just like in his home series. This gag would end up being incorporated into his Marvel vs. Capcom 3 moveset as well. The Player 2 color gives him a gold color scheme, likely referencing the golden armor power of that debuted in the series' second game, Goals and Ghosts. To select Arthur, hold Light Punch, Medium Punch, and start on the Assist Select screen. Tan Pu is a boss from the Strider series. She's an interesting character, but I'll save the nitty gritty details regarding that for the eventual Strider video. She hops on screen and does a large arc and kick across the stage. Her Player 2 color is a pretty cool shoutout to an optional boss fight you can do in the final stage of the original Strider game, The Third Moon, where you can rematch her. Unlike the first fight, she wears a grey and black outfit for the rematch, which is what her Player 2 costume here references. To select her, hold Light Punch, Heavy Punch, and start on the Assist Select screen. I've talked about Devilot's Marvel 1 appearance in Jin's video, but she's still worth mentioning here. She comes on screen and poses before her mech, the Super 8, comically blows up. There's two distinct things about this assist. For one, it's one of the only assists in the game that can take more than one hit before being forced out, and the actual explosion is completely unblockable. The concept of the assist is definitely a shout out to the Durinbo gang, which Devil Out and her gang reference, but also a nod to her story mode in the console ports of Cyberbots, which she prepares to fire a laser only to have the whole mech blow up instead. 
If you watch Marvel 1's credit sequence, you can actually see the beam finally fire as intended. Devilot's Player 2 color might be referencing Santana in his variable armor from Cyberbots. It also bears mentioning that Minot's Devilot outfit in Street Fighter V has a color scheme specifically referencing this color, complete with a blue colored Super 8 standing in for her crystal ball. To select her, hold Medium Punch, Heavy Punch and start on the Assist Select screen. Anita's interesting because she's an unplayable NPC in the Darkstalkers games, accompanying Donovan. Her sole playable appearance in the fighting game isn't in Darkstalkers, but instead in the Japanese releases of Marvel Super Heroes as a hidden character, as well as the Marvel vs. Capcom Origins version of the game in all regions as well. She was more or less just a test character, though the console ports of the game actually make the effort to make her a workable fighter. In Marvel 1, she runs on screen with a bunch of objects floating around her before sending them flying at the opponent. Her player 2 color is the palette she uses when someone selects Donovan's medium punch color in Vampire Hunter. To select her, hold all three punch buttons and press start on the assist select screen. Pure and Fur might honestly be the most obscure Capcom characters to ever touch this series. They're two of the playable characters in Adventure Quiz Capcom World 2, a sequel to the original 1989 arcade quiz game. You roll dice and traverse a Capcom themed board game as you answer various Japan related trivia questions. Like Quiz Nanairo Dreams, this was only ever released in Japan, and understandably so. When summoned, Pier drops down and waves her wand to summon some dice from the sky, which also sees Fur drop alongside them right into Pier's arms. The assist itself isn't that great but it's such a cool deep cut that I can forgive it. Pierce Player 2 outfit gives her a pink costume, but I'm not sure this is a reference to anything, since Capcom World 2 has no Player 2 outfits to speak of. This isn't the only game she's had a cameo in, however. She can also be spotted at the pool in Ken Street Fighter Alpha 2 stage. To select her, hold Light Kick and start on the Assist Select screen. Michelle Hart hails from Legendary Wings, a vertical Capcom shoot em up. She flies on screen and fires off several waves of a three-way projectile before flying away. This one's pretty good at controlling space, provided the opponent doesn't just jump over her. In Legendary Wings, you can level up Michelle's weapon by collecting P symbols. Collecting three gets you the three-way gun, and collecting four gets you the Psycho Flame gun, whose projectile has an arrow-shaped pattern. In Marvel 1, the gun she's using appears to combine both the three-way gun and the psycho flame gun into a single weapon. Probably would have been useful in Legendary Wings. Her Player 2 costume changes her outfit's color from red to orange. To select her, hold Light Punch, Light Kick, and start on the Assist Select screen. The final Capcom assist is one of three hidden assists in the game, Shadow, returning from Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter. Shadow is essentially a what-if character that follows up from Charlie's X-Men vs Street Fighter ending, where he's captured and turned into an experimental android by Bison. In Marvel 1, he uses his Shadow Justice Super, which is essentially Charlie's old Flash Kick Super. His Player 2 color is the same Player 2 color he utilizes in Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter. To select him, hold Light Punch, Medium Kick, Heavy Punch and start on the Assist Select screen. That's it for Marvel 1. Let's jump into the game where she does have a playable presence now. Saki was one of four characters added as a bonus addition to the Wii port of Tatsunoko vs. Capcom Cross Generation of Heroes, alongside Hakushan Damao, Apatsuman, and Beautiful Joe. She could be unlocked by beating the game with and viewing the ending of at least one Capcom character, then buying her from the in game shop. In Ultimate All-Stars, she and the other four Wii exclusive characters were unlocked from the start, with the new Ultimate All-Stars editions becoming the new unlocks instead. I've always found Saki's inclusion interesting, especially when keeping in mind the list of characters considered for and eventually scrapped for Cross Generation of Heroes. One such character on the Capcom side that was considered but ultimately didn't make the cut was Princess Tierra from the Japan-only board game Gaia Master, originally released for the PS1 and later Dreamcast. It seems like the development team always planned to have at least one character on the roster represent their board and quiz game output, and I feel fairly confident in saying Tierra didn't make it in because they decided on Saki instead. 
Saki's theme in Chorus Generation of Heroes is a remix of her line motif in Quiz Nanairo Dreams. The song, both the original composition and the Versus series arrangement, sound like a theme song to a game show, which definitely works considering what Quiz Nanairo Dreams is. Gameplay wise, Saki is one of the game's premier zoning characters. There's characters on the roster that can zone pretty well like Zero and Beautiful Joe, but unlike those two characters who also have above average mobility that aids in rushdown, Saki's more comfortable controlling the space directly around her. A lot of her ground normals are pretty unremarkable, but her heavy attack is notable. She fires a shot from her comically oversized gun. Think Cable's fierce punch from Marvel 2, only you can actually see the projectile this time around instead of just the muzzle flash. She can also use this normal in the air as well, where it fires diagonally downwards. This move plays a pivotal part in two of Saki's special moves in the game, and she'll be able to alter the properties of this bullet in different ways. More on that later. The crouching variant of this is also worth noting. It's one of a handful of normals in Tatsunoko vs Capcom with OTG properties. It can be Baroque cancelled as well. Saki has a slow command normal where she swings her gun, done by pressing forward and heavy attack. This combos cleanly into her launcher, as well as another attack I'll get into in a bit. Saki's first special move is Experimental Positron Cannon, done with a half circle forward and attack. The strength of the attack button determines the number of hits done as well as the pushback one block. This is a full screen laser that does a decent amount of damage. Doing a reverse dragon punch in attack motion has Saki throw out a grenade. The attack strength dictates the trajectory of the grenade throw. Light attack sees Saki toss it out close to her. Medium has her throw it farther away. And Heavy has her lob it up higher to serve as an anti-air option. She can also use this attack in the air as well. The hitbox for the grenade explosion is deceptively large, and combined with Saki's jumping heavy attack gives her a decent way to bully opponents up close. Do bear in mind that Saki can only cancel her jumping heavy into her grenades in Ultimate All-Stars. This was a balance change made from Course Generation of Heroes, where she couldn't do that. For whatever reason, Saki gets a command grab, headbutt, done with a half circle back and attack. You wouldn't think a zoner would get a command grab this good, but here we are. It's fast, it has deceptively good range, can be comboed into from her gunswing normal, which by the way actually increases the range for this grab, can be comboed out of with no issue, and it even works on giants. This move is insane. Double tapping down and an attack button has Saki load some special ammo. The attack strength dictates which ammo she loads, all of which function and alter the properties of her heavy attack significantly. Though after expending the heavy attack, she has to reload special ammo again. The light version has Saki load shotgun-esque spread ammo. This one does the most damage, but also has the smallest range. Yes. The medium version loads a stationary plasma ball that deals multiple hits before disappearing. This has excellent projectile durability and is even capable of cancelling out a few other projectiles. The heavy version loads a single large bullet. This bullet hits overhead and sends the opponent into a spinning hard knockdown state that Saki can capitalize off of. The neat thing about this attack is that there is no readily identifiable indicator of which ammo type Saki has loaded, so you can play some pretty tricky conditioning mind games with this. Saki's first hyper combo is Positron Storm, done with a quarter circle forward and two attacks. <laughs> This is an incredible anti-air super that comes out relatively fast. The only major downside is that it's an anti-air super and only an anti-air super. Saki has a few grounded combo routes into this thankfully, but still. Saki's next hyper combo is her most important one, load super armor piercing shell, done with a half circle back and two attacks. <laughs> Saki loads a special bullet in her gun, similar to her normal ammo load special. 
but this one has a distinct visual indicator and fires off around with especially unique properties when she uses heavy attack. It's somewhat similar to the rifle ammo she can load with heavy attack, but it doesn't travel across the screen as quickly. The trade-off though is that this bullet is completely unblockable in addition to causing a hard knockdown. With the right setup, Saki can completely open up opponents from full screen with proper use of this bullet. If you're in the corner and have the meter, Saki can actually loop these into full touch of death combos. The combo counter resets, but because the bullet is unblockable, you're essentially trapping the opponent in inescapable resets into death or until you run out of meter, whichever happens first. Do bear in mind that loading her normal ammo variations while the super armor pierce for shell is loaded will override it, effectively wasting your meter. Saki's level 3 is a counter super, the world's greatest attack. Saki takes a stance and if she's hit during it, it'll initiate a cinematic where she basically unloads all of her weapons on the opponent. The visual that appears right after she's knocked down is taken from Quiz the Nairo Dreams, where if you've managed to build a deep enough rapport with her, you'll go on a date with her to the planetarium. Now normally, this is where I'd continue on to her assist in her character colors, but when doing research for this video, I decided to look up a video playthrough of the game since no English language walkthrough or translation of the game script exists, no doubt due to the game's structure and obscurity. When looking at this scene in particular though, I got the bright idea to pull out my phone and use the Google Lens Translate app, since it seemed like a pretty important conversation was happening with Saki in this scene. My Japanese comprehension is below grade school level, if that, so it was kind of my only option here. My gut feeling about the conversation was spot on though, because according to the dialogue, a pretty big plot twist involving Saki is revealed here. And it's something I have not once seen in any of the scant bit of English language coverage I've seen of the game, and understandably so. On the date with Saki, she and the player character take a seat at a space exhibit, where she talks about how much she loves the stars before dropping a bomb. While she is a member of the International Defense Force, even that's a cover for her true nature. She reveals to the player character that she is in fact an alien sent by an entity known as Andromeda on a mission to help protect the Earth from outside threats. She's come to love the Earth, their people, and the player character too, but her mission term is almost at an end and all of the fighting she's done has taken a physical toll on her body, so she'll be leaving the planet soon. At first, I thought this was just Google Translate either bugging out on me or playing the biggest prank of all time, so I sought out the Japanese guide for the game, since that's the only other thing I can think of to reference that's at least close to being an official source. Luckily, I was able to find scans of it on the internet archive, and sure enough, her character bio confirms that, yeah, she's an alien. This kinda blew my mind, because I'd never seen this bit of lore referenced anywhere, even by Capcom themselves. All of her appearances outside of her home game focus on her being a kaiju fighting action girl, and only that. That said, there is one win quote in Tatsunoko vs Capcom that might actually be a nod to this obscure lore tidbit. Go Lighton's win quote against Saki is interesting. He seems to recognize her before promising to not blow her cover and wishing her luck on her mission. At first, you could assume that maybe he was familiar with her civilian identity and didn't want to out her as an International Defense Force member. But that's actually not something Saki keeps secret. Everyone in the game is aware of her occupation and she makes no attempts to hide it. Knowing what we know now though, and specifically keeping in mind that Lydon is actually one of a handful of characters in the game that regularly fights off an alien invasion in his home series, it's possible that Lydon actually recognized Saki's true nature, but keeps it a secret since she seems to sincerely want to protect the Earth. This isn't like an earth shattering revelation or anything, but it's a really, really cool bit of character lore that I doubt very many people outside of Japan, myself included, was even aware of before this video. If you're able to get the best ending for Saki's route in the game, she returns to earth after the events of the game and marries the player character. She's still also married to the job though, and when a monster attacks, she flings off the wedding dress and rushes into action. Alright, back to TVC, Saki's assist is her gun swing. Assist, okay. And here are Saki's colors.
And here's Saki's ending sequences. いるんだ。相手どんな子なの教えて。えっとですね。彼は正義感が強い頼れる人です。夫婦出会いのきっかけはそもそも出会ったきっかけは復活する魔王を封印するのに必要な魔法のクリスタルを私が持っていた。あ